and a handful of sand. Now, archaeologists love radiocarbon dating. That's what we all love to use. When I, when I started in archaeology 34 years ago, um, you needed something the size of your fist, and now a little bit of powder can be dated. And we get these dates back, and they said, that's 2,332 years ago. Uh, we think it was a Tuesday. Yeah, <laughs> plus or minus five years. Uh, we love dates like that. Um, but uh, for radiocarbon dating, you need something that was alive. It has to be organic. So you need bone or wood or something like that, charcoal. And remember what I said about water table? If, it's, if it gets wet, it stays preserved. If it stays dry, it stays preserved. Wet and dry, it's gone. We don't even have pollen and phytoliths in the ground here. And phytoliths are, in particular, are considered near indestructible. But that's how corrosive this soil and the water conditions are here in central Texas. So I lose most radiocarbon dating at this site about, in most places, about 8,000 years ago. I can go back about that far. And then I don't regain radiocarbon dating capabilities till about 13,000 years ago. So where it's dry and where it's wet. But the whole middle I can't radiocarbon date because I just don't have anything. So our primary dating technique here is called OSL, Optically Stimulated Luminescence. It's relatively new to archaeology. It's older in geology. I've been using it for 40-some years, and archaeologists, oddly enough, are scared of anything new. But uh, I asked an archaeophysicist how it works. Now, archaeophysicists are real nerds. They wear white lab coats, and they work in nuclear labs, and they regard field archaeologists as a lower form of life. So I said, well, how's it work? And he said, well, do you want the easy answer or the hard answer? I said, okay, skip the jokes. I had the higher math and physics. Um, give me the easy answer. He said, okay, it's magic. <sighs> so I had to listen to a condescending lecture. But what we do with a unit like this one, we take two inch stainless steel pipes, about 18 inches long, and a big hammer, and we bang them into the wall, and we'll do 10 or 12 of them in a row. They take those tubes back to a lab, and in a dark room, from the center of those tubes, they separate some out, those little crystals of quartz and feldspar out, and they tickle them with a laser. That's optical stimulation. And when they do that, they give off energy. They luminesce. Nothing we can see, but the instrumentation can detect it. They tell us when they last saw the sun. They're little alarm clocks reset by radiation. So they tell us when this was the surface, when this was the surface, when this was the surface. Now, all archaeological dating is, we, we talk about relative and absolute dating techniques in archaeology. Relative being like, I've dug up lots and lots of these projectile points, and I know that Clovis projectile points are between 12,700 and 13,400 years old. So if I find a Clovis point and it's in place, not eroded, I'm somewhere in that ballpark. That's a relative date. The scientific methods are called absolute dating, but even then, with radiocarbon dating, you'll get that plus or minus five years. That means that if you take a 10-year block, they give you the date in the middle, and you have a 98 percentile chance of that date being in that 10-year block. So that's what that date they're reporting is, the average. And they're telling you that they have a 98 percentile certainty that it's within that 10 years, five, plus or minus five. And that's as good as it gets in science, and that's pretty good. With OSL dating, I often get things back that are plus or minus 200. But when I'm looking at 15,000, it doesn't make a huge difference. The first guy we had come out to do OSL dating, uh, an expert from the University of Illinois, came out to do these samples. And he looked around and he said, you know what? I'll do a column OSL sample. I'll, I'll do them for free, because it's not going to work. Uh, Mike and I were standing here, and he was kicking me repeatedly, because we were both kind of shaking with laughter. Because an OSL date runs 1500 bucks, so he just offered to do $15,000 worth of work for free. And we knew something he didn't. And he went back to the lab, and he ran these samples, and he called up. It was all, we were in the lab almost like going, wait for it. Here it comes. <laughs> and the phone rang, and he said, Oh my God, I got the best OSL dates I've ever gotten in my life. And they're actually working on a Journal of Archaeological Science article on them. It's just fantastic. He couldn't believe it. And, he, and then we reminded him that he said he'd do these for free. So the elation came down a bit. Um, but uh, then he's like, how the hell does that work? I, I don't understand it. I've worked in Texas before. And you're on the edge of the Edwards Plateau. It's limestone. And the soil is decomposed limestone. It's clay. And you have chert there, but you don't have quartz and feldspar, which is what you need for dating. So where'd the quartz and feldspar come from in the soils here? You guys uh, ever notice our really beautiful sunsets? We get them fairly frequently. 
Unfortunately, we get the best ones, the really good orange and red ones, the day after we wash the car, and you come out and there's a half inch of dust on your car. The quartz and feldspar all flew in here. It's aeolian, and it's windborne. Uh, most often we get it from, uh, you know, the Central Mineral District, which is just over near Llano, stuff like that. But we get a lot of New Mexico and Mexico sands and everything. We had some really good uh, um, sunsets in November. Anybody remember why? It was sand from the Sahara in the yeah. atmosphere. So this stuff's dropping on us from all over. And it's flying near a very large source of radiation, isn't it? The sun. So it's 100% reset. It's like the best stuff you can get for OSL. Yeah, he's never offered to do anything for free. <laughs> Ours is the best stuff you can get for that. So we use lots of different methods.